Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Ace Hardware, helpful hardware men and women dedicated to providing service, selection, and friendly advice. The things you need and need to know. Ace is the place. And by... Vermont American. The blades, the bits, the tools to make American workmanship better. Vermont American. The power in power tool accessories. Before we get started, I'd like to reassure you that if you'd like to build an exact copy of these projects, that a measured drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the instructions that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools safely will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. But remember this, there is no more important rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'll show you how we built our projects. Well, here's one of the pieces of stock for the picnic table. And note what I set it on couple sawhorses and I thought we might have enough time in the program today to show you how to build some. Now there are as many sawhorses as there are carpenters with a carpenter's best friend. We've got quite a collection here at the shop and I want to show you some of the different versions we've accumulated over the years. Here's one that came from a project we did down in Santa Fe. We picked it up at the local home center and it's definitely southwestern. Look at this nice little step detail sort of a typical architectural detail. It's built pretty well, notched in, glued, and fastened with some screws. Now here's sort of the high-tech version that was actually sent by a fan of this old house. It folds up, it's got a handle to carry it, and some fancy hardware. It's pretty lightweight, but I think I'll save this for only the best paying customers, kind of fancy. Now, if that's an example of high-tech, this is an example of low-tech. This one's been around the shop for a while. We don't know who built it, but it's made out of plywood, furring strips, nice wide top, but somebody set the circular saw too deep and cut right through it. But even at that, it still won't die. Look at this, a nice little sort of miniature version of a sawhorse. Now, when it comes to building a sawhorse, there are several things that I think are important to make it work well. And the first thing is the height. After all, it is a sawhorse and I want to be able to saw on it. I want to be able to put my leg up on it to hold the work, use my circular saw or my hand saw. If it's too high, it's very uncomfortable as well as if it's too low. I want it to be strong, yet lightweight. So I use just boards to put it together with plywood to brace the legs so that they won't flop back and forth. And it eliminates the need for bracing, which makes it impossible to stack them. Now I've built dozens of this style. Occasionally I added an embellishment, which was this tool shelf, a place to store nails, the chalk line, or your square. It also functions well as a step ladder. You can step up on the tray, and that allows you to reach some of those higher places. Let's see if we can put a couple together. Now, this is a piece of two by six for the top, and it's a classic length, 36 inches. And the width is sufficient to safely support narrow pieces of stock. Now, the next step is to bevel both edges of the top piece, and that angle is 15 degrees. So the first thing to do is tilt my saw blade on the table saw, and then move my rip fence over to five and a half inches. And what I'm gonna do is run one edge through, turn it end for end, and run the other edge through. The legs for our sawhorses start out as one by six spruce boards. Now spruce is a pretty strong wood and it's pretty inexpensive. It's available at most home centers. 
I've beveled the bottom edge of the leg at 15 degrees. I've also beveled the top, and that matches the angle of the piece that connects the pairs of legs. I'll cut the legs over here on the radial arm saw, and I've tilted the unit so that that is at 15 degrees. And all I have to do is cut four pieces for each sawhorse. On this style sawhorse, there are two gussets on each pair of legs. And what they do is hold the legs together and provide support for the top piece. They're made out of plywood, any old scrap that I happen to have around the shop, as long as it's a half inch or thicker. I start out with a strip eight inches wide. I've turned the arm on my radial to 15 degrees, and I put a pencil mark down here to indicate the right length, which is about 11 and a quarter inches. So I'll just cut my pieces. Now I'm ready for some assembly. Before I attach the legs, I'm gonna lay out where I want them to be, and that's about an inch in from the end, which happens to be the thickness of my little combination square. So we'll just put a pencil mark on each end, apply a little bit of construction adhesive to help reinforce the joint. And what I'll do is pre-drill and then attach the leg with drywall screws. A little bit of construction adhesive where the gusset meets the legs, and those get attached with some more drywall screws. Well, I think you'll agree, that's pretty simple. Now, if you're going to add the shelf, you start out with the same basic sawhorse, the same top and the same legs. But you need to add a few more pieces. One is this rail, which adds support to the shelf. And the other is a slightly longer gusset with a dado to also add support to the shelf. Now, I've set up my table saw with my dado head cutter for a 5 8 width and a quarter inch depth and I'll make the dado in the gusset. Okay, what I've done now is just tilted my dado head to 15 degrees and run a groove along the inside of the rail to help support the shelf. And what I've actually done here is run the piece through the saw blade to bevel the top so that it'll be flat with the shelf. Now we'll just fit the shelf into the dados we cut, which I've filled with a little bit of construction adhesive. And we may need just a little bit of persuasion. Every well-equipped workshop needs at least a pair of these. I know we couldn't get along without them. Now let's get started on that picnic table. Well, over the years, I've had an opportunity to sit and study a variety of different styles of picnic tables. And I think our prototype takes into account some of the best features that I've seen. One is the size. This one is about six feet. It'll seat six people comfortably. The problem is if it's any bigger, it stays on one spot on the lawn and it kills it or it gets so heavy that you can't move it around. It's also important to be the right height. About 30 inches off the ground is perfect. Now the bench, or the seat, 
should be about 16 and a half inches off the ground, and that gives a good relationship between top and seat. The other thing is, a lot of them that I sat at want to tip over. This one's designed so that even if a couple people are sitting on one side, it isn't going to turn over. Now, I've seen these built out of redwood, which is pretty expensive. So I went down to the home center and picked up what I think is the best material package. This piece of pressure-treated 2x6 is for the legs. I learned the hard way on my first picnic table that the legs are what goes first. They rot out. With this material, it'll last forever. Now, for the top and for the bench, I'm using spruce. I don't use pressure-treated because I don't like the idea of food coming in contact with treated lumber. Now, this spruce is really just framing lumber. It's inexpensive, it's light, and I can tell you from personal experience that after you finish the table, if you put a couple coats of stain on it, then stain it every four or five years, it'll last for 20 years. Now, we'll start today by making the legs. They're angled at the bottom and at the top at a 20-degree angle. The measurement from the short point to the long point is 30 inches, and we'll cut those over on the radial arm. First, I'll cut the 20-degree angle on the end of the piece. just use this first piece that I cut as a pattern to cut the other three legs. The next piece to cut is this four by four. In most tables that I've seen, you would see a two by six or a two by eight just simply bolted on the inside of the leg. The problem with that is, is the strength comes from the bolts alone. By using a four by four, you get a good thick piece running through and you can let your leg into it, creating an interlocking joint, which makes it real strong. Now the overall length of the piece is 67 inches and I've beveled the end at 20 degrees so you won't catch yourself on it. Before I make any changes to the radial arm setup, I want to cut three pieces of two by four. This piece, the one in the middle, and one up here. They join the legs together and they hold all the top pieces of the table. The end is beveled at a 20 degree angle and its length is 34 and a quarter inches. next step is to remove the material from the cleat and from the 4x4 necessary to set the leg in. Now, it's a deep dado. I can't remove an inch and a half all at once. It's kind of dangerous. So I'll make it in two passes. I've set up a stacked dado head cutter in my radial arm at about 5 eighths of an inch width, and I'll just take my time and make all the cuts. finish deepening that dado in a minute but before that I want to cut the opposing angle and to do that 
I have to turn my radial arm so that it's on the other side of zero by 20 degrees. Now, before I remove the dado head cutter, I want to make one more dado in the 4x4, and that's to receive this brace, which is part of the center support system. Okay, now with one of the leg sub-assemblies fitted together, I'm going to secure each joint with one eight-penny finish nail. And that'll hold everything in position while I drill holes for the bolts. Now, to make the permanent connections at all the joints, I'm going to use some carriage bolts. But I've sat at too many tables where the bolts stick by and you could scrape your leg. So to recess the nut and the washer, I'm going to make what's known as a counterbore. Now, our counterbore is best made with a Forstner bit. And because of its shape, it cuts a nice flat bottom hole. And it cuts through wood like butter. OK, now I can switch to a 3 8 inch diameter bit and drill a hole all the way through for the bolt. Now the bolts that I'm using are just 3 8 inch diameter, 3 and a half inch long zinc plated carriage bolts. That's not going to go anywhere. I just cut all the pieces that I'm going to need for the top and the two bench planks. And if you were lucky enough to get good quality lumber, you could go right to the assembly from here. But you know me, I got the tools and I got the time. And I'd like to have a smoother surface to start out with for the top. So I'm going to run each board through my thickness planer, planing one side, the face side, nice and smooth. Now, if you don't happen to have a surface planer to give you a nice, smooth surface, you could always belt sand the top just before you put the finish on. Now, with all the boards for the top face side down on my saw horses, I'm going to put a clamp on each end just to squeeze the boards tightly together. And then I'll be ready to fasten the leg sub-assemblies. Now, inevitably, these boards are going to cup and curl a little bit. So I'm using a little construction adhesive to help the screws along and holding it down. Maybe they won't cup so badly. OK, now we'll take the sub-assembly and place it on the adhesive, get it lined up. Now pre-drill for some screws. Now the screws I'm using are two and a half inch bugle head screws and they're galvanized. And what I'm trying to do here is get three screws in each board.
And now the center cleat, some more construction adhesive and screws, just like the others. Let's take another look at the prototype underneath. There's a brace that runs from the legs to stabilize them up to the center of the table to add some support there. And it has a couple angle cuts on each end. I'll make those at the radial arm. This layout is for the angle that meets the four by four and it's 35 degrees. And this is the layout where it meets the 2x4 in the center of the table. And that's also 35 degrees. Okay, now that's the other piece, the other brace. And now what I have to do is turn my radial arm back to 90 degrees. And by placing the angled side of the piece against the rip fence, I can make the cut that's 90 degrees to the angled cut. That fits pretty good. Now to secure the brace to the four by four, I'm gonna use a lag bolt, a four inch lag bolt. And I wanna countersink the head, so I'm gonna start with an inch and a quarter counterbore. Now I'll drill a hole with a three eighths inch bit for the unthreaded portion of the bolt. Now a pilot hole with a quarter inch size for the threaded portion. Now I'll just use a socket and fasten it down. Okay. Now for a couple screws down at the center brace. Now for the seats. Now first a little bit of construction adhesive to hold them down. And what I'm gonna do is first tack the seat in place. Now a pilot hole and countersink. And I think that these three screws will hold it just fine. Okay, well now all that's left to do is round over all the edges with a half inch round over bit.
Well, those were a couple fun projects to build. And now I guess I better think about a couple coats of stain for the picnic table. Now for a finish on my picnic table, I'm just using a good quality oil stain. I'm putting it on with a bristle brush and I'm just gonna let it soak in. I'm not gonna rub it off and I wanna make sure that I cover all surfaces. Well, I'm not sure which of these projects, the sawhorses or the picnic table will get the most use, but one thing is for sure, they'll last for years. Next time we'll build this shaker blanket chest and it features a deep storage compartment at the top and a couple good-sized drawers down below. You won't want to miss it. That's next time, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Ace Hardware, helpful hardware men and women dedicated to providing service, selection, and friendly advice. The things you need and need to know. Ace is the place. And by Vermont American, the blades, the bits, the tools to make American workmanship better. Vermont American, the power in power tool accessories. If you would like a measured drawing of the sawhorse and picnic table, please send $7.50 to sawhorse and picnic table, care of the New Yankee Workshop. Box 9345, South Burlington, Vermont, 05407. The New Yankee Workshop projects are now available on home video. To order your copy of the project you've just seen, you may call 1-800-272-0280. Please have your credit card ready. Each home video includes a measured drawing and a materials list with all the dimensions you will need to build your project. The price for this home video is $24.95 plus shipping and handling. You're watching KOCE 50, Huntington Beach, Orange County, celebrating 20 years. They're back. Monty Python? Oh, you mean the rock group? The comedy troupe that needs no introduction returns to the place where it all began. Sex and violence, we, we like that. Get ready for something completely different. This is an X. Sneak a peek into the life of Python. <clears throat> Coming August 12th on KOCE. It's a marathon. The Are You Being Served Marathon. What do you suppose that means? Get ready for the most slapstick. The most ridiculous. Oh, 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 little boy. Have I got a surprise for you? The most fun Friday night on television. You showed me a mistake. It's the best of Are You Being Served? I'm quite looking for <laughs> Coming August 13th to KOCE. Looks like a pipe. Funding for this old house is provided by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. And by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Now, for the child in the family, a nice oak wagon. Another interesting piece was inspired by a Danish collection, a half-round table known as a console table. 
and incorporates curved rails and curved legs. Now let's get started with a project today that everybody can use in their workshop, a rolling shop cabinet. Plenty of storage down below, a large drawer at the top, and it's meant to be used next to the table saw or as a station for many other portable tools. Some have even suggested that maybe it should be used as a microwave cart in the kitchen. I'll show you how to build that next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram and is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Vermont American, the blades, the bits, the tools to make American workmanship better. Vermont American, the power in power tool accessories. And by Delta International Machinery Corporation. For generations, Delta has been making a full line of precision woodworking tools available through local woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers. You know, the most frequently asked question I get about the workshop is what is the most important tool? And I always respond by saying the table saw. One like this with a good cast iron table and a good rip fence. One that'll stay parallel to the blade giving you nice true cuts. Now if you buy anything any smaller than this, you might be a little bit disappointed, especially when you're trying to handle big sheets of plywood to build cabinets. Now as good as this saw is out of the box from the factory, you can make it even more versatile by building some accessories, like this roll-around shop cabinet. Now, a lot of thought went into designing this. First of all, the casters make it easy to move into position. And the height of the top is even with the saw. Now, the choice of the laminate was not an accident. It was from experience, from accessories that we have on our shop saw. This laminate, I found, is very durable and because it's slippery, almost like ice, makes it easy to push panels through. Now the edges of the top are oak, so that they're durable. And I made sure I allowed the top to overhang the cabinet. And that's so that I would be able to use clamps like this and get a good bite to hold down maybe a router table or a surface planer. The base of the cabinet is made out of birch plywood, which is relatively inexpensive pretty durable and finishes up nicely. Now you know how most drawers, they only open out about two-thirds of the way and you're in there searching around trying to find something that got way in the back? I found some full extension draw slides. These devices right here on the side. It lets it come out all the way and they're strong. They'll hold about a hundred pounds of weight. Now for the doors, I didn't want any hardware to show to hang them. And I want them to be strong. So I chose these European hinges. And they're strong because this part of the hinge is mortised right into the door. Now down below, you have a similar problem. If you have a fixed shelf, you never can find anything that's way in the back. So I got full extension shelf slides. And I put a band around the shelf to keep things from falling off. Now down at the bottom, there's four swivel casters they have a locking device to keep the cabinet from moving around as you use it. Now, if you'd like to build an exact copy of today's project, a measure drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now here's some of the plywood that I picked up at my plywood outlet. And they offer a couple nice services. One is that I don't have to buy full sheets, which is especially good on a project like this because I really need one and one-third sheets. The other thing is that they offer a free cutting service. So I had them cut me some panels a little bit larger than what I need, and I'm going to true up all the edges using my table saw. Now, it's very important to use a good blade when you're cutting veneers. 
It should be one that's designed for cutting veneer plywood. And carbide tips, and notice how many teeth. In this case, 60. And what that'll do is minimize any chipping of the veneer. So now I'm ready to size the panels. The next operation is to do some dadoing. You need a dado along the top of all the cabinet sides. And that's to receive these corner blocks. I suppose you could just nail them in place, but by sitting them in a dado, you get a bigger glue surface and just a stronger block. Because this block reinforces the top of the cabinet and gives me a place to fasten the countertop. I also need a dado that runs down along the inside of the side panels into which the back will fit. And there's one more set of dados down at the bottom of the side and back panels into which the fixed shelf will fit. Okay, I'm gonna dry assemble a couple of the pieces of the cabinet to show you a detail here. Now, all the edges of the veneer plywood that show, I'm going to cover with this thin birch veneer. I'm going to put a piece here, and I'm actually going to put a piece here to cover up the dado that I don't want to see. But I'm afraid that if I don't fill that dado, this veneer is too thin and not strong enough. So I'm going to fill the void with some little pine fillers and just use some hot glue to hold them in place. Well, now it's time to put some veneer on the edges that are going to show. And I've used a couple different methods over the years. One is to just buy regular veneer and apply contact cement to the edge of the panel and to the back of the veneer and just glue it on and trim it off. A few years ago, they started coming out with veneer that already had glue on the back side. And it was activated by heat. So you could just lay it over the edge, take an ordinary household iron, and just iron it on. The latest thing is this edge banding tool. And these really came about due to the fact that shops would want to produce a lot of cabinets and edges at one time. Just a roll of veneer and this little heat gun, which blows hot air onto the glue surface, heats it up so that it gets melted. And you bring out the wood onto the roller and just roll it along the edge. It works great. Now you want to make sure you keep even pressure against the roller and you move at the same rate of speed. That takes a little practice because if you go too fast, it won't stick right. And if you go too slow, it'll overheat. Now when you get about two and a half inches from the end, you just strike this tool right here, which is just a cutter and it shears off the veneer. You finish it off. Okay, now I'm ready to trim the veneer. And you'll notice that the veneer is a little wider than the panel, and that's really just to give you a little bit of a fudge factor so you can get it nice and even. Now, I found that the best way to trim this veneer is to use a router. And I've equipped my router with a straight cutting bit with a little ball bearing which guides along the side of the piece. Now, the standard procedure for using a router is to move it against the rotation of the bit. And really, that's primarily for safety. But when you're trying to trim a very thin veneer like this, safety really isn't, a, isn't the factor. It's chipping. And in this case, you want to move the router with the rotation of the bit. Now, to make sure that everything is absolutely even, a quick run over the edge with the sander, and that takes care of it. Well, now I'm ready for a little assembly, a little bit of glue in the dados. And then when you're working with veneer plywood, it's also a good idea to put a little bit of glue right on the edge of the panel that's going to fit into the dado, because the veneer tends to absorb the glue quickly. I'm 
I'm going to pre-drill for a screw. Now I counterboard the hole a little bit. I'm going to plug that with a little plug later. Now I'll just use an inch and a quarter screw. Pull it all together. Okay, I'm ready for the other side. And any glue that might squeeze out as I'm assembling it, I want to make sure I clean it up as quickly as possible, just with a damp sponge. Otherwise, the surface won't take the finish very well. Now, this top rail gets held in place with a little bit of glue and some four-penny nails. Now, for the bottom rail, the same thing, a little glue, and some four penny finish nails. Now for the corner blocks, a little bit of glue. They simply get slipped into the dados and I'll fasten them with some one inch brads right down through the top corner. Now this center rail is pine, and that's because you don't really see it. It's hidden behind the draw front and the doors. And I'm using some screws to fasten it because I don't have any corner blocks to give it strength. Now remember those holes I drilled for the screws? Now's the time that I think I'll fill them in. A little bit of glue in the hole itself. I use my brush to get a little to put on the plug. I picked up these birch plugs at my woodworking supply store, and they're tapered a little bit, so when you drive them into the hole, they fit nice and snug. And I'm in no hurry to sand them off quite yet. The casters are held in place with four carriage bolts. And I've just started a little bit of a hole by holding the caster in place as a guide. And now I'll finish drilling it through the bottom. Okay, now I'll just put carriage bolt through, give it a tap so it won't spin, and bolt the caster in place. using my belt sander to remove a majority of the doll that's sticking up above the side of the cabinet. Then I'll sand everything smooth with my finishing sander. And that should do it for today. Tomorrow, we'll finish it up. Well, good morning. I've been waiting for you. I want to show you the parts that I've been cutting for the draw. This is for the back. These two pieces are the sides, and this large piece is for the bottom. And they're all half-inch AC plywood. Now, clamped in the bench vise is another piece of birch for the draw front that I've edged. And I'm getting ready to cut a dovetail joint. I'll show you what I mean. This is a different method of joining a draw front to a side. It's a sliding dovetail. The side slides in through the joint, really making it secure. Now, to cut that joint, the first thing that I have to do is lay out the center of the dovetail cut. And I also put an indicator mark here. I don't want to go all the way through and show the dovetail at the top of the draw. 
Over here is a layout line, an offset, that I'm going to set this clamp on and use it as a guide for my router. Now, the router is set up with a half-inch dovetailing bit. And the key here is to hold the router tight to the back of the draw front and against the guide. Move it slowly in, watching through the base of the router, and stopping right at that indicator mark. Now, I've got to be careful because if I pull the router out while it's running, I'm going to ruin the joint because it's tapered. The bit is tapered. I just want to move it in slowly, shut it off, and push it back out again. I'm going to need your prayers. the same router bit that I cut the socket with in my router table. And by carefully adjusting the rip fence, I've made this sample to see how it's going to fit. Let's check it out. Just snug. That's what I want. Now I can run the sides through. Back here at the table saw, I've reinstalled my stack dado head cutter, and I've set it up for a half inch in width, and made a groove along the back edge of the side where the back will fit into it. Well, that takes care of the groove for the bottom of the draw to fit into. Now, to make the groove in the draw front, which is going to receive the bottom, I can't do it on my table saw because it'll show through the ends. But I can use my portable router, which I've equipped with a half-inch straight bit and a guide fence. I'm just going to drop it in near one of the dovetail sockets and run to the other one. The draw goes together with a little bit of carpenter's glue. Let me just slide this joint together. And if it needs a little help at the end, a block of wood and a hammer will do the job. The back of the draw gets glued and nailed into place. Now the bottom of the draw, which is not glued to the sides in front, just nailed along the back. Installing the draw slides is just a matter of following the manufacturer's instructions. Some screws into the draw side and some into the case. Let's see how it fits. Slip it together. Good. Now let's put the doors on. Now the doors, more edge banded plywood, need two 35 millimeter diameter holes for the hinges. Now for the hardware itself. manufacturer of the hinge will sell you this little template 
which makes it easier to locate the hinge on the case. That's all there is to that. Installing the doors is a snap. The top of the cabinet is made from three-quarter inch high-density particle board. There's two by fours around the bottom edge to give it some thickness, and it's all banded in oak. Now, I've already cut the particle board to size and the two by fours that go underneath it. And I'm just going to use a little bit of glue and some screws to fasten the two bys. Now the oak banding that goes around the countertop is mitered at the corners and that's best done here at my power miter box which I've set at 45 degrees. I like to secure the oak band to the counter blank with a little bit of glue. And what I'm going to do first is nail the corners together with some brads and then I'll secure the rest of the band with some screws. The high pressure laminate for the top is applied to the substrate using a contact cement. We'll put a little bit out on the piece, roll it on each piece, and when it's dry, carefully attach them together. Now see, that's just dry. Now you only get one shot at this. This is contact cement. Once it touches, that's it. So I've cut the piece a little oversized. Get it lined up on the edge here, and drop it down. Now I'm just going to take this J roller and bond the two surfaces together. I'm using the same router bit that I trimmed the wood veneer with a little bit earlier. One final detail for the top. You'll notice that I chamfered the edges all the way around. And to do that, I just set my router up with a chamfering bit. I'm going to secure the top to the base with four two-inch screws through those corner blocks we put in earlier. These cleats will hold the hardware for the sliding shelf. Okay, now we can build the tray. Using the table saw, I've made this rabbit, which will receive the bottom of the tray. Just as with the edges on the countertop, I've mitered all the corners over at the power miter box, and now I'm attaching the edges with glue and some one-inch brads. Now, before I install the shelf, I think I'll give everything a coat of sanding sealer.
This is a water-based sanding sealer. And it's a good choice for a first coat because it'll seal the pores in both the hardwood and the softwood. I'm going to coat everything inside and out. It should dry in about 30 minutes or so. Then I'll take a look at it and maybe I'll put one more final coat of a good hard polyurethane to really protect it. Ever since I built this shop cabinet several months ago, I kicked myself for not having done it sooner. It's an indispensable item in the workshop. Now next time, we're gonna build this outdoor lidded bench. It's perfect for the back porch or any place it's gonna be subject to the weather. That's because it's built out of cypress, the perfect outdoor wood. And I'll show you how to make it next time right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Vermont American, the blades, the bits, the tools to make American workmanship better. Vermont American, the power in power tool accessories. And by Delta International Machinery Corporation. For generations, Delta has been making a full line of precision woodworking tools available through local woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers. Tomorrow, KCET ventures outdoors for the delightful series Gardens of the World with Audrey Hepburn. This beautiful and entertaining hour begins at 10 tomorrow night. This old house is next. To order a measured drawing of the Rolling Shop Cabinet, please send $7.50 to Rolling Shop Cabinet, care of the New Yankee Workshop, Box 9345, South Burlington, Vermont, 05407. This is PBS. The New Yankee Workshop projects are now available on home video. To order your copy of the project you've just seen, you may call 1-800-892-0110. Please have your credit card ready. Each home video includes a measured drawing and a materials list with all the dimensions you will need to build your project. The price for this home video is $24.95 plus shipping and handling. Don't you just love watching other people work? Then get set for This Old House, coming up next. Next on Mystery, treachery in the final hours. What exactly do you care about? Well, I tell you one thing, lady, I'm gonna get your kids back for you. If there's a problem, I always deal with it. But tonight we'll have it right where you want. The conclusion to The Kinder on Mystery. Tonight at 9 on KCET. This is KCET 28 Los Angeles. Member supported television for Southern and Central California. Thanks to our members and the following for supporting KCET's programming today. Deft, maker of America's biodegradable wood stains, is proud to be supporting creative and educational programming on KCET. We think that's important. She does, too. Deft, the wood finish family. We start from the top of the building down, and we basically will scrape all the loose paint off, uh -huh. making it intact, which means that it's ready for, for repainting. Gee, it goes over to this big mess over here. Surely this dates from the last century, and I would expect it's disconnected. It sure should be, Steve. It doesn't look very good there, but I have a tester right here. I'm going to test that and just check. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection with auto, home, life, and health insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. For each of the day's top stories, join us for the McNeil Lara News Hour, weeknights at 7 and 11.30. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. 
But today we're going to build this classic plant stand, perfect for displaying your favorite plant. We found the original in an antique store in England. We'll take you there next. Then I'll show you how to build one of these for your own home right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram and is made possible by Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and finishes that enrich, protect, and preserve the natural beauty of wood. Delta International Machinery Corporation. For generations, Delta has been making a full line of precision woodworking tools available through hardware stores and home centers and by vermont american the blades the bits the tools to make american workmanship better vermont american the power in power tool accessories well today we're in the town of royal tunbridge wells which is about 30 miles from london and in history this was a place where the royals would come to draw water from the spa we're in a shop known as upcountry and it's packed full of antiques both english and continental look at this armoire a beautiful pine armoire and the tag says that it's danish and uh, actually it can be yours for about 1200 pounds but I know they'll negotiate. And over here, it's a nice uh, farmhouse type of table. This is French, a scrubbed pine. You can still feel the wear of the top. This can be yours for also 1,200 pounds. And if you like, you can even pick up the china. Now this is an interesting piece. It has a little wooden latch, which allows a pair of the legs to swing around so that the top can flip down. It makes it very portable. And what it's for is wine tasting. You could take the table from vineyard to vineyard, set it up very quickly, and try out the wine. Oh, and look at this. All over Britain, I've been looking at pieces with these worm holes. Now, they tell me that the worms are not active, but that the worm holes add a lot of value to the piece. I also think it kind of adds a lot of character. Now, what I brought you to see is over here in the corner. It's a, just a tall plant stand. It has very delicately tapered legs, an intermediate shelf to hold it all together, and actually uh, put another plant right here. The rails are just thin pine that sit in mortises, and then, of course, a pine top, a place to put your favorite Boston fern. What I like about it is that it's very simple, yet it's elegant, and I think it's going to be pretty easy to build. So maybe we'll do a couple. Well, here it is, our version of the antique plant stand. I made it out of pine like the one we saw at Upcountry Antiques, and I maintained the tapered leg. The only difference that I have is that the rail that supports the intermediate shelf is mortised into the leg instead of just nailed onto the inside. So now if you have a big Boston fern that you want to set in your living room where no one can touch it, you might want to build a couple of these. And we will have a measured drawing and a materials list, which you'll hear more about before the program ends. Now before we get started today, I want to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, follow, and understand all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now to start our project today, I want to take this slab of what's called sugar pine that I picked up at my wood outlet and make some leg blanks. Now it's a soft pine, even softer than the standard C or D select pine that we use on our projects. But it has a very fine grain. It doesn't have this coarse texture. It's very fine and straight, which makes it a good choice for a thin tapered leg. Now 
what I have now are four blanks that are just a little less than an inch and three-eighths square. And what I want to do is run the pieces through my surface planer so that they end up being an inch and a quarter square. So the idea is that all four pieces want to be exactly the same. So I'll make a pass on one edge, then turn it 90 degrees and make a pass on an adjacent edge on all four pieces before I change any setups. On the first pass, I removed about a sixteenth of an inch. And because this wood is so soft, I'm now going to be able to take it right to inch and a quarter and run the other two sides. Now, the standard way to taper a leg is to use one of these, a tapering jig. This is a homemade version. And what happens is when you place a piece of wood in it and keep the jig against the rip fence, as you push it through, it cuts at an angle, making the taper. But here I have a 50-inch leg, and I can't even get far enough back and have any kind of bearing on the rip fence. In fact, it would be pretty unsafe to even try it. So I guess it's time to build a jig for tapering longer legs. First thing I'm going to need is a piece of plywood. I always end up with these little strips of plywood from different projects, and I wonder why I save them. But it, on a day like today, this is where they come in handy. I'm going to cut a piece about 65 inches long. Now this board needs to be about four inches wide. Well, now a little layout. First, I'm going to measure 49 and a half inches down, which is the overall length of the leg. And square a line across. Now I'm going to come up to this end and measure down five and a half inches. And that's the amount of the leg on the top that I don't want tapered. Put a line across there. Now we'll put a mark at an inch and a quarter, the width of the blank as it stands now. And then down here at the line I already made, we're going to put a line, a mark at 15 sixteenths. Now we'll just connect those two points with a straight edge. And take this scrap of plywood and fasten it right along the line. Now a little stop block down at the end against which the leg will rest. This little scrap of pine is really just a guard to keep the operator's fingers clear of the blade. Now let me put one of the blanks on the jig to show you what I'm doing next. I'm going to put this scrap of plywood, which makes it even with the top of the blank, and then fasten this clamp to hold the blank when we push it through the saw. Now, to secure the top and bottom of the blank, especially ones that might have a little bit of a curve to them, I'm driving a four-penny finish nail at the bottom. I'm just going to snip it off so a little sticks out and acts like a little point. 
And up at the top, I'm just going to put a little screw through, and the point that protrudes through the top will hold the blank. Well, now we'll give the jig a try. First, I'm going to take the blank and push it up against that bottom pin, give it a little tap to set it. And up here on the top end, I'm just going to squeeze it down onto the point of that screw and tighten the clamp in the middle. I've installed a feather board on the table saw to hold the jig tightly against the rip fence, which is set at four inches. Okay, now I'm going to take the blank, turn it 90 degrees, reset it in the jig, and cut the adjacent side. Now the sawing operation leaves the edges a little bit rough, so I'll smooth those using my joiner. Now it's time to cut the legs to their final length. And if you look at the prototype, you notice that the leg flares out in this direction when you look at it from that side. And when you look at it from this side, it also flares out. So in order for the leg to sit flat on the floor and for the top shelf to sit flat on the leg, I need to make a compound cut. So I've set up my radial arm with the blade tipped at five degrees and the arm swung over at five degrees. I want to make sure that I hold the outside corner that's straight up against the rip fence. So I put an X mark on each side that's been tapered. We'll trim a little off the top, measure it for length, and cut the bottom. The final length of my leg is 49 and a half inches. Next, I want to cut the mortises in the upper portion of the leg for the rails. The rails are a half inch thick, and they just slip into the mortises. To make the mortises, I'm going to use my router table. And I've set it up with a half inch straight cutting bit. And I've put a piece of tape on it for the leading edge and the following edge of the bit. In the sample, I can show you what happens. Always holding the straight edge of the leg against the fence. We'll make one mortise by starting on the end and running it through until the line on the layout aligns with the line on the table. For the adjacent mortise, I'm going to have to make a plunge cut, dropping it down so that I line with the front pencil mark and just push it through. Well, now with everything set up, we can run the legs. The next step is to make the mortises for these intermediate rails. And to do that, I've moved the fence back about a sixteenth of an inch. And that's so the mortise will end up centered in the width of the leg at that point. The height is still the same. Now, I have to keep in mind that the straight side of the leg will always be against the fence. I'll make a plunge cut and a mortise that will end up about an inch and a quarter long. Now, using a sharp chisel, I'm going to square up the bottom edge of all the mortises.
top rails are made from half inch thick stock and I've ripped and jointed a piece to four inches wide. Now I'm gonna have to cut the ends of the rails at an angle, five degrees, which is also the angle of the flare on the legs. Now the length of the rail measured at the shortest point, which is across the top, is five and three quarters strong. Now the lower rails are also half inch stock, except this time they're only an inch wide. Cut at the same five degree angle, nine and seven eighths along the top edge. The next thing to work on is the lower shelf. It's made from half inch thick stock and it has to be notched around the legs. So I've taken a piece and laid out each corner, clamped it in the bench, and now I'm just gonna cut them with my little dovetailing saw. Well, now we can begin to assemble it. I'm going to apply a little bit of glue in all the mortises and some on the ends of all the rail pieces. Now with any glue that's squeezed out, removed, I'm gonna pin each of the joints with a one inch brad. Okay, now let's set this one aside to dry and build another one. Now before I can attach the two subframes together, I'm gonna have to clean this mortise out a little bit now because the rail sticks in on the corner. So I'll clean that up with my utility knife and my chisel. With two frames pre-assembled and those mortises cleaned out, I can now start to put the entire piece together. Before I can attach the other pre-assembled frame, I want to put the lower shelf in. And when I made the mortises, I overcut them a bit so I would avoid having to square up another corner. And it really doesn't matter because the shelf is going to cover it. Now this is the last chance to put this shelf in place. And what I have to do now is slip the other frame in, we'll clamp it and nail it together. Right, now to secure the shelf, I've just put one nail in each side, no glue. That way it can expand and contract a bit if it has to. And with that, I think we'll set it aside to dry and come back to it tomorrow to finish it up. Well, I got started this morning by taking this piece of stock and chamfering the edge using my joiner with the rip fence set at a 45 degree angle. And that's gonna become this little molding that dresses up the top shelf. And I find that it's always 
easier and a lot safer to put the detail on the edge of the molding first and then cut out the smaller piece. It'll take two rip cuts to get the final piece of molding. The first one will be for the molding's thickness. And this final pass will give me the width. set my miter box at a 45 degree angle to cut all the pieces and they'll be attached in place with some one inch brads. Well now we'll make the top shelf. To ease the edges on my top shelf I'm using my router which I've equipped with a quarter inch rounding over bit but I've only exposed a little bit of it below the table. Now to secure the frame to the top shelf, I'm gonna use a wedge that I've cut on each end at a five degree angle because the rails also flare at a five degree angle. I've cut it a little bit long so that it will just wedge itself in there. Now, to actually secure the top, I'm going to use one two-inch screw. Right in the middle. And now, what that does is secures the top shelf firmly to the base, yet it can still expand and contract with changes in moisture. Trying to make this new pine look like that country pine is a really thankless task. Even the pros over in England, who do it for a living, tell me that unless you're willing to take the piece and maybe dip it in a caustic solution and play around with a lot of different stains, it's still not going to come out looking like the antiques. So we're going to try a couple things of our own. Today I'm putting on a water-based stain. The color is called Spanish Oak. And I'm going to put it on with this foam brush to start, nice and even, and then take a rag and wipe off the excess. I'll do the whole piece, getting it as even as possible. After the stain was completely dry, I applied a coat of sanding sealer. And that's a good choice for the first coat because it fills the pores of the wood and it gives me a proper base for the final finished coat. I sanded everything with 220 grit sandpaper, and I filled the nail holes with this soft putty. Now, it comes in a whole range of colors, and I simply found the one that was closest to my stain color and filled the holes. Now, it's soft, and it won't fall out of the holes later on because it doesn't dry out. With everything tacked down or all the dust removed, I'm ready for the final coats, which will be a gloss polyurethane. It's a water base. So it dries fairly quickly. I'll put on one coat, let it set for about 20 minutes, give it a light sanding, and put on the final coat. And then it'll be ready to use. Hey, hey, look at that. It works. And you know, I think we're getting real close with our combination of stains and polyurethanes to that English country pine look. It's a very useful project. And so isn't the one we're going to build next time. Give up? It's a the Delft rack. It's meant to be hung on the wall, and along the shelves you would display your rare china or Delftware. There's even some cubbies for little knickknacks. Now, the original we found in a private collection in a castle over in England, and I'll take you there next time right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by... Parks Corporation, makers of safe and simple, environmentally responsible stains and